Okay, welcome to council time. It is 1300.01 p.m. 21st of August. Uh, we'll begin with a council roll call. And I, I understand we may have and may not have Glenn is on the phone, so let's see if he responds to the roll call. Oh, one minute. Councillor Young? Here. Councillor Belcott? Present. Councillor Bowerman? Present. Councillor Marshall? Here. And Chair Medvigy? Present. So, amendments to the agenda. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Medvigy. I do have an amendment to the agenda. It would be 9.4. Under pending litigation, RCW 4230-110, open parenthesis one, open parenthesis little i for five minutes. No after action. Okay, I'll, I'll refer to that as 9.4. Without objection, we'll go ahead and add that. Public comment on agenda items only. Do we have uh, Greg, uh, Gregory Smith? Good afternoon, counselors. My name is Gregory Smith and I live in uh, Shalachi. Um, I'm representing a fairly newly formed organization known as the uh, Shalachi Prairie Coalition. And understand we're going to be talking about uh, the surface mine overlay um, issue that's been before the council for the last 18 months or so. Um, just wanted to be clear to anybody who's here and, and those that are in remote uh, attending the session, um, by and large, we are not anti-mine at all. Um, however, we are pro-environment and we have been watching um, issues behind our houses literally for that same period of time. And so that being said, I'll keep my comments short here, uh, but we're hopeful that the council will do uh, the right thing for the citizens of Shalachi. And uh, we appreciate the service you provide the community, first and foremost. Um, but again, just wanted to reiterate that we are watching uh, the environmental issues associated not only with the mine, uh, but also potential railroad expansion activities in Shalachi as well. So again, grateful for what you guys do for us but we have a lot of folks uh, watching and monitoring uh, the environmental impact um, that this is probably gonna have. And I gotta say, um, the environmental impact statement and uh, determined significance was not done initially. Um, don't know exactly where this is gonna leave this afternoon, but uh, we are concerned. And again, uh, many thanks for your time. Thank you. Diane Dempster. My name is Diane Dempster and I'm on the board of Friends of Clark County. On August 14th, 2024, Chair Medvigy spoke at length on the issue regarding the county's non-compliance with the state Washington, Washington State Growth Management Act. This letter is to reiterate Friends of Clark County's position set forth in its letter to the council dated June 25th, 2023, which we have resubmitted along with the new letter. As of March 23rd, 2023, the Growth Board held that the county was not in compliance with the Growth Management Act. The board also held that the surface mining overlay ordinance substantially interfered with the goal 10 of the act and issued the order of invalidity. The order of invalidity meant that if the council, if the county remained out of compliance, it could potentially be ineligible for millions of dollars in state grants and low cost loans. On May 18th, 2023, Dr. Horgiaco and Ms. Cook told the Planning Commission, both in writing and orally, that unless the county repealed the surface mining overlay ordinance, the county would remain out of compliance and subject to loss of grants and low interest loans from the state. Ms. Cook specifically told the Planning Commission, and we quote, the issue is not 
So the issue we've got an ordinance that the growth board says is illegal. The only way I know to come into compliance is to get rid of the ordinance. Despite the dire warning and knowing the financial sanctions were possible, the Planning Commission refused to repeal the ordinance and voted to remain out of compliance. On June 27, 2023, Dr. Orgiaco and Ms. Cook told the Council, both in writing and orally, that unless the County repealed the Surface Mining Overlay Ordinance, the County would remain out of compliance and subject to loss of grants and low interest loans from the State. Thus, at least as of June 23rd, the Council knew it was out of compliance with the GMA and the Council would need to repeal the SMO in order to come into compliance and failure to come into compliance would risk loss of potentially millions of dollars in grants and loans. In addition, based on the record from the June 23rd hearing and the prior appeal of the comprehensive plan, it appears that the Council knew or should have known based on past history that this matter would take two to three years in the courts and the risk of losing funding while the case was pending, a final decision was real. It is also of note that at the June 27th hearing last year, some counselors professed that being in compliance with the GMA was desirable. However, despite knowing all of that information, the council voted three to two to remain out of compliance and thus accepted the risks that would be ineligible for funding. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Goody. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Goody and I'm on the board of Friends of Florida County. I'm continuing oh, wait. Sorry. I am continuing the comments delivered by my colleague, Diane Dempster. On July 31st, 2024, the Council was told that due to noncompliance, there was over $6 million in funding for which the County would be ineligible to receive. Therefore, given those revelations and the board's order from November 28th, 2023, it is crystal clear that the county is not in compliance, has been denied approximately $6.4 million in funding, and if the county fails to repeal the ordinance now and thus come into compliance, with the GMA, the council would continue to put the county at risk for being ineligible to receive millions of dollars of state grants and low cost loans. As stated at the June 2023 hearing, whether the county wants to come into compliance is a policy decision. The council can either choose to side with the gravel mining company as it did in 2023, remain out of compliance and subject to financial sanctions, or the council can choose to side with county residents, repeal the ordinance, and come into compliance with the GMA, and again be eligible for those state grants and loans. Based on all of the above, Friends of Clark County supports the recommendations made by Ms. Cook and Dr. Orgiaco at the previous public hearings that it is good to be in compliance with the law and that the council should repeal subsection five of section two of ordinance 2022-07-01. Thank you for your time and allowing us to comment. Thank you. Armand DeLeon. Is it on? Yeah. Hey, so my name is Carmen DeLeon, and I went over there and, and looked at the minutes for the 14th. Is this thing working right? The, um, I go by Mellow, by the way. And uh, during minute 12 of the uh, minutes of the 14th of August, uh, it was this committee that said, I'll, I'm bringing it up, that's what he said, and we were warned about this $6 million, and um, it was um, spoken about on the 14th in those minutes that they should have a vote on whether or not they should comply. So, I mean, why would it even be a question to comply with the GMA? I thought it was just 
we should care about our environment, and they're deciding whether they should or whether they shouldn't, and if it, 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 it you know, should be even an issue. Well, yeah, it's an issue because it's costing us millions of dollars. And um, that was in minute 13 that they stated it's a never-ending lawsuit they are losing grounds on, and that um, I won't be here next year, but in other words, I'm sticking y'all with the problem because they just made it worse, non-compliant for years, and he even knew. He said, hey, we're losing money, but maybe we want to talk about it to the public. So thank you for being here because they don't even know if their opinion counts. I don't even know why they have public hearings because they make their decisions before we ever got here. So this is just a waste of breath. On the 14th, also the minutes are, well, maybe we should hold a public hearing. Well, guess what? When we show up, they don't like what we say, so they kick us out. So how public is the hearing when they don't like what you say, so escort them out of the building? You know, it's, and I came in late because at, um, do I have time? I'm getting tired of sitting in here and listening to the rules, and the person reading the rules is the first one breaking the rules. At minute 222, the cherry said that it is interrupting as a form of um, trespassing. I guess trespassing on our words, which he takes for granted. I don't know how many times I've been asked to leave because he doesn't agree with me. This isn't a court of law. We are human. We have emotions. and. If he thinks he's going to run it like it's a courtroom, it ain't a courtroom. It's a public forum. We have a right to speak. I think you should do so. And um, the reason he don't like bringing up the comp uh, proclamation is because they took it from us. And like I've said before, I don't care that they took it. I care that they don't have their own ideas because the embarrassment is sitting right up there and no place else. I'm embarrassed that that's a cherry. <laughs> what a joke. Thank you once again for well, those positive comments. We, we have someone else in the we, room who would like to comment. We, break the rules. we do. Wayne Gersich. Everybody else in compliance. Where you come to escort me out right now? Hi. Is it on? My name is Wayne Gersich, and I'm here, I want to talk about the minutes of the last meeting. And they were talking about the PFAs in the water, and they were also talking about the opiates. And what's interesting is last year I was at the post office, and I met some people that uh, were in apartment buildings, and they said that their water had PFAs in it, and they couldn't bathe in it or anything. And this was over a year and a half ago. And what's amazing is that the county didn't come in and put a big, huge tank where these people could get their water and not have to carry big five gallon tanks or anything to it. And they didn't tell them that you couldn't bathe in it either because your biggest absorption is through your skin. But the thing that's amazing is that the PFAS that's in the water is um, the F in there is fluoride. So if you've got these poisons in the water uh, and then you've fluoridated the area too, you've quadrupled or whatever the, the fluoride levels. And this should be banned. You know, the Biden administration shut down the EPA. There was a, a lawsuit in San Francisco, and they shut it down this year because they wanted to keep the fluoride in the water because they know it causes all kinds of crippling bone diseases and everything. And they shut this down. So they're still saying that it's okay to put poison in the water and add more poison to the water that they haven't cleaned up. So how many years is it going to take to get this stuff out? Where are you going to put it once you get it out? And another thing, too, if you're selling this to Battleground, that um, if it's got PFAS in there, then it's already got too much fluoride. And I was very shocked because I was telling the mayor on Monday that if you're going to do anything for these kids, the people that are in those Shriner commercials are the ones that have been affected by these, these chemicals. And it's, it's kind of amazing that they still want to keep it in. And since they know that it's poison and you guys have all of the records that I put on public record, it's very important that you do this. But the thing about toilet to tap is one of the things they have in the water is alkaline hydrolysis. They're liquefying dead bodies and lie in water, dissolving the flesh and pour it down the drain. So if somebody died of fentanyl overdose, you need to check that water for fentanyl too. There's a lot of things you're not checking that water for and the spiked prion or the spiked uh, protein from the uh, COVID jabs 
we need to know how much is in the water because it's coming through your tap. So when you recycle the toilet water, you're not only drinking someone else's medicine, you're drinking their disease. And they can do a lot of things to um, fix the water without using chemicals. But all this other addition to anything they put in the water, we should be able to have clean water. And you've got plenty of money to do it. And these people should have a tank. And another thing, too, is do not put 5G cell towers on water tanks. There's one on, it's uh, 119 Avenue that goes down in my neighborhood. There's a, a 5G cell tower okay, on the water tank. Okay, thank you. Tanks. That exceeds your time. And just a reminder for other public comment, it's agenda items only. And we have a lot of substantive work to do today on our agenda items, and people are here with heartfelt public comments on those agenda topics. So that's why we have rules. We're trying to conduct a business meeting here. Is there anyone else in the room who we do. have a comments on agenda uh, items only? Wynn Garsich. Rebecca, we already did uh, that person. So who's the next person? Kimberly Goheen Elba. Sorry about that. Yeah, this podium was designed to make it difficult for us, we the people. Again, we when was on agenda. He spoke on August 15th minutes. Um, I will ask the clerk to stop my time if I'm interrupted by counsel from this day forth. Do if not I'm on the phone the or if I'm not. Thank you very much. Uh, make sure that you remember to stop my time if I'm interrupted. So today this council will make a date for a public hearing on the Chalachi overlay. Uh, unfortunately, they decided to do it back in August. So they're, they're uh, just taking their time to do this, I'll tell you that right now. I would suggest that everybody here multiply and assemble, get, get, get a lot of people here to do this. Uh, not just for your cause, because I'm here for everybody's cause here in Clark County, Washington, USA. And by the way, my name is Kimberly Goheen Elbin, Patriot Life Citizen of Clark County, Washington. Um, on those minutes, it mentioned Comcast and CBT. Uh, they services and it mentions government. I will tell the people now. I will tell the people now that this uh, entity is government owned, and when the next pandemic comes, I quote Mr. Medvedji. It will come. Uh, the government uh, public media system will not give us the truth. So be aware of that. You need to stand up for that too. As far as uh, Shalachi Prairie, I uh, did warn the Battleground uh, Council again. Uh, we want to stop the Growth Management Act. I realize uh, some people want them to follow it. I get that. Uh, however, the Growth Management Act is uh, actually illegal and it's causing us to have to accept illegal immigrants of which this council, I believe, is illegally harboring illegal immigrants against our law and making us unsafe. Also, public comment is written on the minutes of um, August 13th, the right here, and it mentions that when Gersich, Carmen De Leon, and Kimberly Goheen Elbin spoke under open public comment, that actually should have read on public agenda items only. So it makes it look like we get an open comment, we did not. And I also want to mention on that note that this council yesterday is an example of the 6 p.m. meeting that uh, you can come and have comments on any comment you want, and it has that three minutes has to include also the agenda consent items. It used to be a few months ago, you got three minutes on those too, because frankly, they have sometimes 18 agendas on a, on a one day uh, agenda, and you have no time to speak because they've co uh, conglomerated. You can only speak three minutes now at, an, at a meeting. This is our meeting. You need to understand that. We don't thank them for listening. They must listen. This is our government, and we must stand now like our forefathers warned us to do. When our government becomes dangerous, we are to abolish them. We are here to stand in assembly Thank you. peacefully. That exceeds your and, time. Uh, we'll go ahead and Thank I, you. I did see some hands out in the audience that may have not signed up. Okay, if you could go ahead and step forward. I I have some maps.
Teresa Hardy um, in relationship to Camp Bonville. CAG meetings continue to be routinely canceled. April, May, June, July, August, all canceled. That means the CAG has met only three times. At each of these meetings, there were contentious discussions about the CAG's charter. All CAG members finally acquiesced to the county manager's demands and signed the charter without comment. CAG and the community have legitimate concerns about the transparency and correcting the record. We recognize the county is taking steps towards addressing these concerns, but ending the current CAG would squander their expertise and prevent re rebuilding trust. These next comments are regarding law enforcement activities at Camp Bonville, which has everything to do with cleanup. We appreciate some of the steps the county has taken to regain control over management of Camp Bonville. However, it is unacceptable that you still plan to move forward on a five-year contract with the FBI for the use of the shooting range after it has been proven with documentation spanning the FBI's entire tenancy up to as recently as 2020 that they have violated their agreement by allowing law enforcement to book other areas of the park and to buy toxic chemicals such as HC and CS gas, as well as detonate explosives in the very headwaters of the Lacamas Lake, which are currently contaminated with the um, com chemical components of explosives. While the county has not improved its website, while the county has not improved its website FAQs on Camp, on Camp Bonville for transparency, it is at least clear that the county has conceded these violations did indeed happen. For context, and this map shows where some of the activities have taken place and their proximity to Lacamas Lake. The interests of the FBI and the interests of Clark County regarding use of Camp Bonville are in direct conflict. The FBI wants to continue to use the entire park for as long as it can, while the county's goal is to evaluate and complete the cleanup of the property it owns for potentially someday becoming a regional park. It is not reasonable to give the FBI another chance, and it should not be up to the taxpayers of Clark County to put, foot the bill for extra enforcement of the FBI should they remain. The FBI is a federal agency that should perform its activities on federally owned land and pay for its own remediation. The FBI should leave, and the Clark County Sheriff's Office could remain while the county finds an appropriate place for shooting that is not property intended for incidental revenue producing activities compatible with natural resources con conservation for the U.S. Conveyance Code and the quick claim okay, deed. Thank you. Thank you. Complete your time. Um, were there any else, anyone else in the room before we go online? Okay. There's no one online. Okay. That concludes public comment. Old business, the minutes. I move approval of the minutes. I will second that with a couple of corrections that I'd like to see made. Go ahead. Uh, one would be under the third bullet to change uh, chair Marshall to counselor and under the first bullet to chair uh, to uh, change uh, counselor Medvigy to chair Medvigy. And then I second the motion if those uh, corrections are made. Thank you for catching that. <laughs> okay, so uh, you're interrupting the meeting, ma'am. We're going to ask that you be removed if you can't control yourself. Any further discussion on the amendments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I think I heard five ayes. Motion carries. All right, new business 5.1, Calix Indian Tribe Letter of Support. So Jordan's not here. Are you yes, so I'll, um, I'm putting this before council for your consideration. The Calix Tribe is applying for a wash stock consolidated grant program for 2025 to 2027, and they're asking council to support uh, provide a letter of support. Um, this is to help conti the continuation of the world demand response 
and ensure that they have transportation options available to them to access important destinations, destinations such as medical appointment shopping and entertainment and also bridging a gap between uh, Cowlitz, Lewis, and Clark County um, and operates in a smaller communities that are not served by fixed route transit. So they're just asking council to provide this letter of support for their grant application. So first, any questions? Karen, Rochelle, Glenn? Questions. Sue? Okay, so uh, I fully support it. The more we can do with the Cowlitz tribe, the better. I see one thumb up. Glenn, you're gonna have to orally tell us. Two thumbs up. Yep. Good. Glenn, are you on board? Good. Okay, thank yep, you. Thumbs up. All right, moving on to 5.2, Chalatsi Bluff Surface Mining Overlay Ordinance, GMA compliance issues, public hearing. So this is per council's request last week to add this topic as an agenda item today for council. So I can lead on this since I made the motion to do this. Uh, this is to decide whether we have a public hearing. Um, first and foremost, I think we just need purely speaking more transparency. I mean, there's stuff that happens, stuff that happens a year and a half ago, two years ago, that happens in executive session. The public doesn't know about it. We forget about it. And some of these things keep rearing its ugly head. And this is not a classic case of executive privilege where we have an opposing party, if you will. Um, this is not a lawsuit that we really specifically need to be careful. Um, and I and just sitting up here with Councillor Marshall for a minute, I mean, it keeps coming up. I can't remember what was in executive session. I can't remember what was publicly said. I think we, we can either waive executive privilege or just plow ahead, because a lot has been said publicly now. Um, but I think we need to address this issue um, publicly, and whether that's uh, a public hearing to revisit the vote, if you will, on, on whether to remove the overlay or not. I don't want to completely regurgitate what I said of putting this on, but the real danger is it'll never be decided. Uh, there's, there's this constant misstatement that we violated the law. We did not. Uh, the board does not make law. They interpret it. Uh, the legislature could have required an environmental impact statement for an overlay. They didn't. There's no RCW that requires it. I mean, the two general principles that gave the GMA board its open door, if you will, was well, when you want, you want to have an environmental study at the earliest possible moment, and, and by case law as well as by statute, if there's enough specificity that it actually is a, a project, then you should have an environmental impact statement. So it's a factual dispute, but this becomes a separation of powers issue if this county suffers without the ability to have a court rule. The court rules and will abide by it and with some deference to the future, whether or not, uh, if there's an unfavorable ruling, whether there is an attempt to go to the Supreme Court on it. But the bottom line is the, the county suffering. And uh, as we were re reminded and, you know, we thought, at least I thought we were in compliance. You know, a stay was in place. It should have been in place for all purposes. Uh, additionally, we reversed ourselves on requiring an impact statement for the perm for the owner of the property or the, the operator that wanted to uh, have the overlay put in place. It should have been for all purposes. And that was my comment to, was, is this a mistake? 
Have we communicated with the agencies? Why are they penalizing us when we're waiting on the Court of Appeals to rule on something that's in a gray area? I mean, and before a lot of the members of the council that were here, this was discussed, and it's been common practice in compliance with the GMA, overlays do not impact the land. They don't change anything. There's further processes in place and requirements for environmental impact statements if there are specific projects proposed. And that was the law as understood by everyone, including community development. That's what we were told universally from beginning to end in and out of executive session that it did not require an impact statement, a study. Um, the environmental lens is a really important one and I applaud those who are advocates, but it's not the only lens. And we don't have the luxury up here, at least we shouldn't, of focusing on one lens. So we have to focus on all of them. And so I'm very fearful that if we reverse the overlay, it'll never get litigated, it'll never get decided, it will be moot. Uh, the court has already passed it from one district to another because of uh, their congestion. So uh, there's very little chance that if we remove the overlay uh, that this legal issue will ever get resolved and and that's administrative overreach by the by the GMA as much as we respect them respect their decision and respect the growth management act um, we should have the ability to test this to the court of appeals and yes we don't know when that will be um, I, I guess we haven't had an update since we last heard that there may be a request for continuance on oral argument. I'm assuming that Christine Cook at some point may want, if you can tell us uh, whether oral argument is still set or been pushed out into the future. We don't have an end date. And even once it gets orally argued, who knows how long it'll take before they rule and whether they rule in our favor or not. So in any case, those are really the issues today, whether we want to go to a public hearing to consider uh, removing the overlay. I'm not in favor of it. I believe in our separation of powers. I believe in the authority of the courts. I do not believe that any administrative board should be legislating. And the stay should have been for all purposes, not just on any act of, of the board itself, but for any agency in the state. We should not be losing grants. And I'll add one other point to it, and um, again, it's a, an issue of executive privilege and not, but I'll be as vague as I can. Our stormwater permits in jeopardy by the act of a third party. Yet, we were told, don't worry about it, it's been deferred, we know you're doing, exercising all due diligence to correct it, and that you weren't the cause of it. So there are times, and so we shouldn't be losing any low-cost loans or, or grants as a result of the jeopardy our stormwater permit may be in. So in any case, um, we did get an email, and I did want to also ask Christine Cook that, um, whether or not, I mean, the question was posed publicly, is this a mistake, are the other state agencies um, not aware that that the decision was stayed pending the appeal. Um, the answer I thought we heard was this is a gap in the law and it will take a legislative fix to ensure that we don't lose loans and low cost uh, or grants and low cost loans. So those two questions, when, when are do we have oral arguments scheduled and have we really resolved with any agency that holds a grant that they understood that the growth management board stayed their adverse ruling? So the first question, um, unfortunately, no. Uh, the oral argument was scheduled. 
the attorney for Friends of Clark County uh, said he would be out of the country and gave some alternative dates. Of course, they're not the only party, not the only attorney, so the rest of us looked at the dates that were that he gave as possible. They weren't possible for all of us. And uh, he has since filed a notice of unavailability with the court that lists numerous dates that he will be out between now and the end of January. Um, I don't know how that meshes with the court's oral argument calendar, so I don't know what the resolution of that is going to be, but the current status is that the um, court issued a, an order continuing oral argument until a time to be determined. So that's where we are on oral argument. May not happen this year, probably won't. And then as to the possibility that the stay wasn't communicated to the agencies, is, did you see um, the lawyers? Yes, I did you know, see I, you just Mr. Housley's letter and I very strongly disagree with his assessment of the order from the growth board issuing the stay. I, I went through it, it's seven pages long. There are four times in there where the growth board says, now remember we're not staying non-compliance. Non-compliance and invalidity are still in effect. So, um, I don't, that seems to me to be uh, contrary to how he reads it, but it's certainly the words of the order. I have it right here. Um, so I don't, I, I think it's kind of a binary situation. Either the county's in compliance or we're not. And once we aren't, my understanding is that we go on a list. <laughs> and I do, I, after seeing that, I do recall us being told that, and that was part of the discussion on requiring the impact uh, study of the applicant um, to put us in as a tactic or technique to put us in the best possible position with the Court of yes. Appeals. Um, any case, thank you for answering that. Other questions? You're welcome. By, Let's start with Karen Bowerman. I don't have questions, no, thank you. But I do support the idea of going forward with a public hearing uh, to bring the matter to public um, eyes. Okay, um, question by Councilor Marshall. Yes, um, just as we're framing up this issue, I see it a little bit differently. Uh, the SEPA process itself for non-project applications, many of them are have no impact and, and EIS is not required. And as I understand it, and please feel free to correct me, it's more a question of the size and scope on the non-project applications. For example, the comp plan updates, large scale, multiple jurisdictions. So, and, and the SEPA process itself, the public is given, what, 14 days to comment and uh, determine whether or not there should be an environmental impact statement. If it was a blanket, all non-project applications don't need an EAIS, why, why even go through this and, and allow public comment? So I think there's, uh, there's, there's a way to, for the public to weigh in on this and, and in this case determine that the scope, this enabled uh, a larger impact. So like it or not, that's where we're at. Uh, and I think in coming into compliance, because I'm very concerned about the loss of funds and this could go on for another couple of years and we don't know exactly what other impacts we may 
be facing. 6.4 million over the next five years is a significant impact. Uh, so I would want to correct that. Now, whether or not uh, our withdrawal, uh, our removal of the overlay renders the case moot, I think there's still some questions as to whether or not that would be the case. And it, it could be argued that this is an, ex, an exception and that it could still go forward. So there's uncertainty there, some degree of uncertainty. Um, so I would, my, I believe that, uh, that we should have a public hearing to consider whether or not to remove the surface mining overlay. And in doing so, it's my understanding that we would come into compliance with the Growth Management Act and we would no longer be in jeopardy of losing grant funds and that the 6.4 million could be reinstated once we came into compliance. Thank you. Um, let me just call on you. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Christine had a comment. Yes, I'd like to um, respond to the counselor's initial comments on why there is a, uh, why the growth board required an EIS here. And I agree with Councillor Medvedji to a large extent. I think it's, um, it's a factual matter. SEPA says that the count, that local governments may require an EIS for a non-project action, but the local government is not required to. So unfortunately, it is, SEPA is worse than vague about the circumstances when a local government should require an EIS. In my view, an EIS was not required here because we don't know what the project will be. And that is my fundamental disagreement with the growth board's conclusion. The growth board says, oh, we have these maps and we have this drawing and this analysis. Well, that shows we know all about the project. We know enough detail that an EIS should be required, but none of those maps or drawings or analyses would be binding on the applicant if the applicant were to apply for a permit. They can do different maps, different drawings, different analyses, so those things aren't binding, and I, I think that's, that's where I come down on saying this is a matter where the growth board gave the wrong, came to the wrong conclusion about the significance of the facts before it. That's a, and therefore I think they're legally wrong and factually wrong. Okay, thank you for that additional detail. I'm gonna call on counselors just to make sure we hear from each of them. This is an important issue. Michelle, do you have a question or comment? Just a comment. I agree with Councillor Bowerman and having um, the public be aware and weigh in on this. Okay, so no question, but you're another thumbs up for moving forward as with Sue Marshall and Karen Bowerman, correct? Yes, yes, correct. Okay, okay, how about Glenn? Glenn, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still on. Yeah. Uh, my sentiment is very much the same. I do want to move forward to a public hearing on this. Um, thank you, Chris, for your comments. I think that sums it up well. I have real concerns about the impact of this, you know, the Growth Management Hearing Board decision. I, I think it's going to have a very chilling impact in that we as a governing body and the public are going to actually see a lot less detail on what plans are. So what's going to happen is they that no information is going to be provided and they're just going to ask for an overlay or they're just going to ask for a zone change. 
I, as a, as one of the decision makers, and I I appreciate having as much data in front of me as possible. I appreciate being able to understand what the intent of a future project would be, and, and that information will simply not be provided to us when it goes to a public hearing for the simple reason that it's provided. We'll have to do an environment. So I have grave concerns with how this thing ends up, but we do need to move forward to public hearing and address the issue of the county. Okay, thanks, Glenn. I think you were starting to break up a little bit, but we got the general gist. I think all at this point, all five counselors are asking. Um, so when can it be scheduled? How do we do this? I'll have to look to see if it's a 10 or 15 day notice, but we have to do a public notice, so we'll get that um, on as soon as possible. Okay, I was told it's a 15 day notice. So um, when we're done this afternoon, Rebecca will draft up the notice and we'll get it posted. Perfect. Um, so anything further before we move on? Yes, I need to hear the Okay, no, I'm sorry, you're interrupting again. I, My name is Christine Cook. I'm a senior deputy prosecuting attorney. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes this topic. Great discussion. We look forward to the public hearing and the continuing public scrutiny of the issue. Council reports, item six. I'd like to give a shout out. Please go ahead, Karen. Uh, first, uh, to the accessible community, the ACAC, uh, for one of the members, Eric, who called attention to some handicapped uh, parking signs, uh, one of which had actually been removed by a business owner, and um, then uh, others that just disappeared. And so, and the, the painting on the on the sidewalk was uh, way too faint and so on. The second shout out is to code enforcement and the director of community development who followed up on that with persistence, spoke with the business owner, educated them and got the matter resolved. And I think this is a perfect example of an advisory committee and the, and the county staff working together by sharing information and getting the job done. So thanks to both. Super, thank you. Councilor Marshall. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to call folks attention to uh, the Washington State Association of Counties will be having their statewide conference right here in Vancouver. Uh, if folks are interested in participating, the early bird sign up is uh, deadline is this Friday. So we would get a $75 discount if people sign up by this Friday. It looks like a, a, a very uh, um, thorough uh, agenda that includes jail and juvenile facilities, opioid impact, a great opportunity to network and learn uh, what other counties are doing. Uh, and the date will be November 19th through the 21st. I know I'm interested in attending. Super. Michelle, Glenn, Councilor reports? Nothing yeah, for sure. me. Go ahead, uh, Glenn. I had I had planned to attend and wasn't able to, unfortunately, the ribbon cutting ceremony for the uh, the community court. So would, I know that uh, Council Marshall and Chair, you were there as well. Would one of you be willing to report on that? <clears throat> okay, I, I am happy to do that. And we did do a, a press release, I think on behalf of the county. I mean, we've been working on this for years in law and justice and other places. This is a great partnership between the courts, primarily district court, uh, the city of Vancouver prosecution office, our defense bar, 
the county, and then all of the service providers. Uh, it is tied to our situation with homeless and what to do with some of these, what we call quality of life crimes. You know, we don't want to lock anybody up. We want to help them. Uh, and community court does that, but it requires res responsibility as well and work. And all the service providers are there to weigh in. Uh, people are getting housed. People are getting substance abuse treatment. And then ultimately their case gets dismissed if they're successful in completing the program. The, it is so successful, it has grown already. We had to move it from one location to another, so it was the ribbon cutting for the new facility. I am hopeful it outgrows that facility as well uh, because um, as we start enforcing more throughout the county and throughout the cities, it brings help, it brings resources to that population that's living on the margins. So I think it was well attended. Um, it all looks great. Uh, the city made the facility available, uh, so kudos to them. They solved the growth problem, at least for now. Um, what else would, would you like to know, Glenn? It's, it's well and thriving, and Sue Marshall would like to add something. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. I would just like to commend the chair. He uh, participated in the ribbon cutting with uh, Mayor Ann and gave some heartfelt uh, comments, which I think that uh, everyone really appreciated. It was a great job. Uh, and especially moving, there was someone who had uh, participated in community court who uh, described his situation as, you know, within death within a couple of days because he was on drugs and homeless and uh, his life has just turned around. So I think, you know, the elements to really solve some of our problems are there. It takes the resources to continue to uh, support that. I also had the opportunity to uh, attend graduation for therapeutic court, and again, similar situation. There are a whole team of service providers that just wrap around uh, folks that are, when they're ready to make the commitment to change their lives, the support is there for them. So I'm very impressed, very proud of the work that Clark County is doing. And uh, community court in particular is a great collaboration between the city and the county. Thank you, and I'm sorry, but I have to add one more thing, just for the general public as well, because you mentioned therapeutic courts. Some people criticize them. Hey, we're not holding them responsible. We are. But, but the bottom line is for taxpayers, it breaks the cycle of recidivism. That's the goal. It's the holy grail of the criminal justice system is to have people become productive citizens again not continue to offend. And so the money is well spent, uh, whether it's community court or the therapeutic courts, it is best, it reflects best practices and the best that the county, the community has to offer to help people out of um, their situation. So with that, any other comments or questions? Otherwise I did want to add, Jordan's not here. And normally, he's been spearheading our proclamations, which, by the way, he wrote the one for the 4th of July, not for me. Not me. He's not here. And uh, next month is National Hispanic Heritage Month. So I did send him an email in anticipation, knowing he's coming back next week. Um, that we could very quickly come together. I don't know if any counselor is working with uh, any group. I have not personally received any requests, but I certainly would advocate that we recognize um, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, with a proclamation. So I'm looking forward to quick work once he's back. Anything further on that? Okay, so we'll move off of counselor reports. We'll go to item seven, work session request 7.1.
Yes, so the first one is from Public Works regarding speed limit changes. They're looking for about an hour um, to go over the process for evaluating speed changes as well as specific locations that will be proposed. There is a public hearing that will happen on September 24th. So this is just to see if council has any specific questions or additional information for that hearing. Thumbs up, okay, I see. Everyone's got a thumb up and Glenn, any objection? No objection. Hearing none, thank you. Uh, 7.2 Camp Bonneville update. Yes, um, and just as a reminder, the last time we had a discussion on Camp Bonneville, staff did state that ecology stated that we were done with the cleanup and that we were reaching out to them. So we are anticipating a letter from ecology in, in August. Um, that will either confirm or deny that the cleanup is done in accordance um, with the rules and regulations. Um, go ahead, Chair. Well, I was just going to say they have a regional rep, they have a local rep. Why don't they participate in the work sessions? So they actually, I mean, I, I we can a lot to ask for them to come, but we can of certainly extend the invitation if Council would like. Okay. Um, and then um, I will also just say the, the website has been updated because that was the last update, waiting for that information. Um, this work session is to uh, provide that update from Ecology as well as the cleanup actions um, on the remedial investigation feasibility study. So this is just gonna, you know, so nothing has happened there. We are still negotiating, I believe, with the FBI that has not come before council again. Um, the contract has not come before you, but that is still in the works um, in those negotiations. So this is just an update. There hasn't been an update since then. So I just wanna ensure the community that nothing secret is happening. It's really waiting for ecology's information, um, making sure we're hitting the five-year cleanup action plan that is also managers of public participation, I think through ecology for that. It's not a county function. Um, so, and then negotiating the contract. So there is actually no update until this particular time. Thank you. I am certainly supportive of the update. Yep. Other thumbs up online, Karen, Michelle? Okay, and Glenn? Um, perfect. perfect, thank you. Uh, 7.3, Humane Society of Southwest Washington. Yes, um, so the next two are kind of linked. Um, the staff is getting ready to talk to council in the coming month regarding a contract with the Humane Society. So just in preparation for that, we would like to invite the Humane Society based on some information I've heard from council as well, just to provide a very succinct overview of the role of the Humane Society, what's going well, and from their perspective, um, what could be improved upon. Um, I'm thinking like 15 minutes, so to keep it very clear. And then the second one is the Animal Protection and Control Advisory Board. They're also a very, um, uniquely tied to the county in providing um, oversight or advice regarding animal control. And this is also a 15 minute request to give them also an opportunity to meet with council. Their bylaws do state that they're supposed to be giving an annual report to the council. It hasn't happened since I've been in this position. So two separate work sessions, probably the same day where one can do one and then the second one will happen. We'll have staff available just for questions, but the staff work session would come after when we talk about a potential contract moving forward in contract terms. And that was gonna be my question, whether we'd have them in the same morning, seated together, it may be a good thing. Um, I really very strongly support the participation of the Humane Society, and I definitely want to hear from the Animal Advisory Board as well. So I support both. How about yes. Councillor Marshall? How about you, Karen? Yes, I, I see do. Michelle's yes. thumb up. I'm both. Okay. And Glenn? Yep. Okay. I'm both. Okay. Um, are we skipping policy updates? Well, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not sure if it's policy, but I do wanna follow up on Councillor Marshall's comment about the local conference. Um, so per the rules of procedure, the chair um, has to provide that approval in writing and also 
um, we, we need to check with budget. Uh, so I've already started doing that knowing Council Marshall was going to um, bring this up today. So I would like to know if any other counselor is interested in attending that. So just for the budget look, um, and then I can send something to the chair. Kathleen, I am. I actually um, asked Michelle Fenning about that this morning. So yes, I'm interested in that as well. Karen, how about you? I believe I'm not able to make it. Uh, thank you. Though. Okay. And Glenn? Yeah, I missed that. Is that the WASAC that we're talking about? Yes. Yeah, I, I won't be. I won't be attending that one. Okay, I will check. So there's Wait, two different, uh, so there's, yeah, hold there's two on, different conferences it's, and I've, I've got a second one that I'll bring up. So this is the local one here for county leaders. There is a second conference that three counselors have asked to sign up for, which is the Board of Health, the local Board of Health training that's out of town. And that actually goes over October 2nd. So we're not gonna have a quorum for council time. Uh, so we will need to cancel that Wednesday meeting because we do have three counselors wishing to go to that. And I believe that one, Wasak is actually paying for it. So Glenn, if you could just confirm by email with the manager on both events, I'm, I'm not planning on attending either. Okay. And Councilor Young, we do have you down for the, the local Board of Health training that's yes. out of town. That's so correct. we already have you signed up for that one. Um, and so just to confirm you're interested also in attending the one that will be in Vancouver in November? Yes. Okay, so I have Councillor Marshall, Councillor Belcott, and Councillor Young. Um, I will confirm with you guys once I get confirmation from budget um, and we can move forward from there. Thank you. Yeah, that's, the schedule uh, may interfere with some council meetings, so that would be another thing to look at. It's November 19th through the 21st. And Michelle, at the local one, since we're quasi hosts, at least it's our hometown, I would ask you to be responsible for any opening remarks on behalf of the council. And if you're not able to do it, that you pass the mantle uh, to Sue and Glenn. Okay. Do that. That's, so, that's what um, I wanted. That's the conference I wanted to attend. Actually, both I'm going to the Department of Health, which I'm registered for, and and I would like to go to the local one as well. So we may want to look at the agenda on the 20th because that is our annual budget work session in the morning. So let's just look at the agenda to see what is on there enough if that's a time we can still keep or if we need to do a different date. Okay, anything further on policy updates? All right, we have four executive sessions. Uh, the first is on collective bargaining for approximately 10 minutes. Uh, any potential action on that one? No, okay. And then 9.2, potential litigation, 9.3, pending litigation under 42, uh, 0 .30, 0 .110, paren 1, paren little i, each for 10 minutes. And then 9.4, um, are we calling that pot potential litigation as well? I'm assuming no action on any of these items. There's no action. You're right. You can call it potential litigation. Okay. And then um, five minutes. So roughly 35 minutes. It's almost five after. Why don't we try? Uh, to come back at 2.30. So if we can immediately go into executive session, we'll resume this uh, council time at 1, I'm sorry, at 2.30, if I said 1.30. Um, you mean, nope. it would be 2.40. 2.40. Right, 35. 2.40, I stand corrected. All right, we'll see you uh, online in executive session and Sue and I will be in the back room. <laughs>
another announcement that the chair has asked us to announce that the executive session will um, be extended for another um, five minutes and open session will reconvene at 2.50. Thank you. Another announcement uh, from the chair. Uh, the executive session will be extended for an additional five minutes. Open session will reconvene at 2.50. Thank you. 2.55, sorry. Okay, that took a little bit longer than we thought. We had a lot of um, business to take care of. There is no further action. We did conclude our meeting with council uh, on a number of matters. We stand adjourned.